Hey, um, I'm Julie Dubin, and I had the pleasure of working with Ella Abrams this spring. And she is a junior um, at Sacred Heart Preparatory in California. And um, Ella just has so much curiosity and passion for learning in a wide variety of subjects. She is especially interested in many STEM subjects, as well as social and ethical issues. Um, she's interested in learning and ultimately using that learning to make a difference. Um, Ella and I had a great learning journey together this spring. We dove into newborn screening and urea cycle disorders, and we learned alongside each other. Um, she exemplified resilience in her learning process and grew so much through uh, the spring. I'm very happy to introduce Ella and excited for her to share her project with you today. Wonderful. And Ella, take it from here. Thank you for the kind introduction, Julie. So yes, I'm Ella Abrams and I'm a junior at Sacred Heart Preparatory in California. Next slide, please. So my mentor, Julie, deserves so much credit for everything that she brought me through this spring. Um, she lives in Fort Collins, so we are just doing our virtual meetings. Uh, she's an di executive director of a nonprofit organization called Peaks to People Water Fund, and she volunteers with the Immigrant and Refugee Center of Northern Colorado. So all around, she's just an amazing person. She also loves to hike and spend time in nature and watch sunsets like me. Next slide, please. So this spring, we reviewed the challenges and advances of newborn screening for urea cycle disorders in the United States. I hope to formulate my research into a paper and eventually an academic poster. And the reason I chose this project is because it is a current issue, which that I felt I could research thoroughly. And then I also could be biologically, technologically, and ethically curious about. Next slide, please. So this is a brief overview of what I'll be reviewing. I didn't do any computing style project like Jody did with her amazing work. So I will be doing um, a more biological comprehensive review. So we'll first go over the newborn screening and its applications. What are urea cycle disorders? The public health initiatives for urea cycle disorders, which involve clinical, technical, and ethical components. Next slide, please. So my project is Early Detection Matters, Exploring Newborn Screening for Urea Cycle Disorders. Next slide, please. So what is newborn screening? It is the most widespread application of screening technology and provides the most comprehensive application of genetics and health services. It's been in use for over 40 years and has benefited hundreds of thousands of children worldwide. It originated from Guthrie and Susie's 1963 test for metabolites from jive blood spots using bacterial inhibition assay. Um, and it has just been a great development in the healthcare world. Next slide, please. So this gets more into what urea cycle disorders are and why it's important for us to know. Um, when a person eats food that contains protein, the body will break it down into amino acids, but it'll only use what it needs and change the rest into nitrogen. So this will be important because this nitrogen needs to be removed from the body as urea, which is important for later. Um, and then urea cycle disorders, it's also very important to know that they are genetic. They most likely occur when, they, when a baby inhibits the gene from both of its parents. But in the case of OTCD, which is the most common urea disorder subtype, it is normally passed down through the baby's mother who has a infected X chromosome, but is not affected herself by the symptoms of the, of the disease. Next slide, please. So the urea cycle, this was the main portion of my research. So as I talked about the excess, excess nitrogen and the amino acid breaking down cycle needs to be converted at, to urea and removed from the body as a waste product. Um, ammonia, which has a molecular formula NH4, is what the nitrogen gets turned into through a series of biological processes. And it is removed through the urine in the body as this diagram shows. In the top left, you can see the liver and the mitochondria of the liver is where the ammonia and the CO2 reside. The urea cycle is the yellow um, circle you can see to the right. Every arrow you see in that circle is a vital enzyme function. When a, when a person is missing one of those enzymes, which is a urea cycle disorder, that is um, the cycle will not be able to continue as you can see. And there will be a backtrack and a buildup of ammonia, which is an extremely toxic uh, substance in the bloodstream. That is why the only surrogate marker of a urea cycle disorder is mild to severe hyperammonemia. And this, can lead to symptoms like irritability, 
headaches, vomiting, um, in milder cases, and then in more advanced cases of ammonia levels greater to 200 micromole per liter, there are brain damages, seizures, coma, and even death in the fatal cases. Next slide, please. So you would think that because of all the horrible impacts of urea psycho disorders that they would be a mandatory um, public health initiative across the United States, but they are not. Some, some diseases that are tested for in newborns are immunodeficiencies, cystic fibrosis, hearing loss, and other things like that. Um, so like I mentioned before, OTCD is the most common UCD subtype, but it is only screened for in the states of Kentucky, Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. To the right is a diagram where you can see the lifelong effects of a range of children who had um, a urea cycle disorder. The type of urea cycle disorder varies as well as the age from range three to 16 but you can see their lifelong effects with the urea cycle disorder. So it really does inhibit a person's quality of life. Um, normally the children who are treated for by a, for a urea cycle disorder are treated through um, hemodialysis where there's a special dialysis machine um, using a filter known as an artificial kidney to remove the toxic ammonia from the blood and transport the clean blood back, back into the little ones. So that's how they're normally tested for and treated for. Um, but the reason that they're not regulated for is a series of sub reasons that I'll get into on the next slide, please. So one of these are the technical challenges, and this has been the main concern in developing an effective public health initiative for urea cycle disorders. The direct measurement of ammonia is actually not feasible in newborn screening. It can be tested for in a blood sample, but it is not diagnostic of only a urea cycle disorder. Additionally, glutamine and erotic acid are elevated in urea cycle disorders, but they're highly unstable, unstable substances that cannot be tested for. So overall, there is an absence of a universal um, parameter or biomarker for urea cycle disorders, which has led scientists to this day to use a combination of specific parameters and, ra and different ratios to, con to consider what uh, these children need to be tested for in the Guthrie blood spot exam. Next slide, please. There's also a system of clinical challenges that um, are present in discussing urea cycle disorders and newborn screening. Symptoms for these children that are affected by the disease occur soon after birth between 12 and 72 hours. After that, patients rapidly deteriorate and they can, of course, die in the most fatal cases. Um, but it does take about three days until the results of the Guthrie blood spots test become available. So within this time frame, it is extremely important to get the children on dialysis, but without the correct um, results, it, it's pretty much like they, they can't test or they can't provide the effective treatment without the right results. Um, there's also another uh, portion to this, which are late onset disease patients, which still retain some residual enzyme function and have milder symptoms with pretty much no need for medical intervention, but they will still come back as positive for urea cycle disorder. This will bring us directly into the ethical challenges, which I'll talk about on the next slide. So these late onset patients oftentimes will, will end up being um, treated for urea cycle disorder, even though their life would be completely fine without that medical intervention. And this also just cause causes so much unnecessary stress for the family. So this has been a real debate between healthcare providers to see if it's even, if the, these type of patients really even benefit from early detection. Um, there's also another important uh, component, which is opportunity cost. This is an e economic term that can be translated into a healthcare term. So pretty much healthcare providers um, or healthcare decision makers, they'll figure out what healthcare or public health initiatives to fund based on the life of years or life years saved, um, the quality adjusted life years gained, um, how easy it is to diagnose and how direct the treatment it is, all of these different um, components go into figuring out what public health programs to fund. And that is currently why urea cycle disorders are not one of the funded programs because they just have so many challenges, which I've talked about prior. So next slide, please. I know I, that was kind of a lot, but my progress has been really, really helpful for me as a student. And I've really enjoyed learning with Julie. Um, along the way, we've discussed this topic with local physicians and my science teacher at school. I've done a lot of online research, including peer reviewed scientific journal articles. And like I said, I'm planning to formulate it all into a scientific paper with the help of magic. 
and my mentor, Julie, and then hopefully eventually an academic poster with my high school AP biology teacher. Next slide, please. I've really enjoyed my magical experience as being part of a pro this program. Some of my highlights are getting to know my mentor via our weekly check-in questions, as well as the moments when new topics just clicked. Um, I learned how to read scientific literature, like I mentioned, and also filter information that just was not necessary for me to know at my age and education level. Um, there's also been a lot of challenges, like approaching contradicting information from different sources, answering certain biological questions that were just extremely hard for me to comprehend, and then also comprehending the urea cycle, which did take a while. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm open to any questions. Wow, Ella, another great presentation. Way to go. Thank you. I, I'm going to encourage you to take yourself off of mute and ask questions to Ella. Hi, Ella. Uh, Smriti here. First of all, fantastic presentation. Um, it was really, really interesting and well explained. And I think I really appreciated how you had all of the lenses from technical to ethical, and this really holistic review of the whole process. I feel like I was able to learn about this and become more aware about it just in this forum. So I hope that, you know, with all of this work in the paper and poster, you'll be able to have a wider reach on such an important topic. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned one of the concerns is like invasive, it might be an invasive process or like people might not want to add this to another suite of tests that they have to do. Mm -hmm. How, what is the procedure? Is it the, is it a blood test or what exactly, how invasive would it be for especially the late onset um, candidates, I guess? Yeah, that's a great question. So the blood tests themselves are pretty much also known, the Guthrie blood spots are also known as a heel prick. So all it is is just a small little prick into the heel of the infant. And then they put the blood into five different spots on the card and test for different metabolites in the blood to see what um, enzymes that the child is lacking. So that's not the invasive part that most people are worried about. It's mostly just the dialysis machine because like in slide 24 with the picture of the infant, it was, there was just a lot of mechanical equipment and it's just not necessary because they have the enzyme function in order to continue living their life and being okay. And they wouldn't experience some of those um, long-term effects that I went over. Um, and there's also, so in some cases, there does need to be a liver biopsy done to see what exact type of urea cycle disorder is affecting the patient. And there's mm -hmm. also a lot of, of course, parents and decision makers who just are not okay with their child being like um, kind of investigated on in that way and just pricked a lot when it's not necessary for them. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And another question I had was you mentioned that it takes three days to get the results back from kind of what you were able to find out while you're doing research. Is there work in reducing the time of that or speeding up the testing and infrastructure so that that's not a problem? Yes, there definitely is. Unfortunately, I didn't go too much into the technological side of like why exactly it takes so long. I know that they're testing for a series of urea cycle disorders, each one named by the function of a different enzyme that is missing. So it just takes a lot into looking into what exact enzyme is um, missing and is the issue. And mm -hmm. because of the lack of biomarkers, that's why it just takes so long to look for that one enzyme. Um, so I know that there is a lot of work being done in that, but truly there, I personally like to bring my own opinion into this. I don't think there's um, as much of a focus as there should be into researching this just because other um, people or there are other, the other programs, like I talked about an opportunity cost that are, are the focus of most public health, um, I guess, justice seekers to put it in one way. So I think there is being work done based on all, like all the peer reviewed articles I read were people who did studies to to make this process faster and more efficient for the kids. Um, but other than that, I, st I think there, there could be more work done there and I think there should be more work done there. But um, yeah, I hope that answers it too. Yes, yeah, thank you so much. We had a question pop up in the chat here. Do you think more states will start to test for this condition? That's a good question. Um, I don't think so. I don't think unless there is a big just... Um, if, unless there's a huge change and they're the scientists figure out what a better way to test for the a urea cycle disorder um genetically and they can figure out what kids will be impacted before the kids are even born if they can figure out um how to test for the enzyme deficiency quicker if they can figure out how to get those test results back quicker 
if all of that can be figured out, then maybe, but that also just takes so much money, so much funding, so much time, so much effort, so many resources out of other programs into putting it into um, urea sex disorders. So I genuinely don't think anywhere in the near future, the other states will start testing for them. Um, but I think that's something that the healthcare and public health world can be optimistic about. I have a related I, question. Sorry, does anybody else have a question? Go ahead, please. I, I just had a question. Uh, Ella, thank you so much. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, during your research, were you able to find out what the mortality rate was for the newborn infants? Uh, no, I wasn't able to figure that out, but hopefully I'll be able to. It also is a real, re really rare disease too, though. So it's like about one in every 32, I'd like to say, 32 to 40,000 kids impacted by this. So that's another thing to answer Mr. Abrams's question. Um, it's just not also a huge disease that impacts people as often as like cystic fibrosis and immu immunodeficiencies do. So that's another thing public health people need to take into consideration. And, and then my follow-up question is one of your slides indicated that for those uh, that contracted the disorder at later in their life, uh, the intellectual disorder, uh, what what did did your research show what intellectual damage occurred to those that um, encountered the disease later on in life? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for that paper where I got the diagram from, it just talked about like kind of their learning challenges. Mm -hmm. So in elementary to middle school, they would just have trouble processing things, um, kind of keeping up to school or up, up to speed with the rest of their classmates. And that was the biggest thing. I don't have any direct numbers as to like how many did um, other than what the diagram said. But um, it's because a lot of a lot of kids that are impacted by a urea cycle disorder, um, Unfortunately, they do go into a hyperammonemic state of or coma. So they are, um, their cognitive function is greatly decreased the second that they go into that coma and that impacts them for the rest of their life. And those are some of like the long-term effects, like um, just lesser school performance than, than their counterparts. All right. Thank you so much. Ella, I wanted to say that this is a huge topic and you've done a phenomenal job in four months, especially for an 11th grader. Um, you. You've done a wonderful job of presenting, just like the previous mentee. Um, I know that you focused on the scientific aspect, which is what you want to do, but there's also a social political aspect. This state that you and I live in, California was not mm -hmm. on the list of five states, I think, that actually do this testing. So hopefully after you do the poster and you know the presentation, hopefully you'll have um, an audience where somebody will pick it up, if not yourself, and actually make a plea to our legislators, mm -hmm. the funders, so that they can actually fund something like this. A, a prick doesn't sound like it might be too expensive, but I don't know all the details of it. So I'm hoping that this work will have a huge wider impact. So thank you for doing it to both you and your mentor, Julie. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And I agree. I hope that it can really make a change in the community we live in. Yes. Thank you, Julie. That's wonderful job, Ella. So articulate and your passion and knowledge for the subject just shined through. Great job. All right.